I think tonight, of course, will be in Exodus chapter 2, and then um, we'll, we'll take a break here for a couple weeks going into our revival services because chapters 3, 4, and 5 really flow right together, and then the end of October we'll, we'll pick up there and go for a little while before Christmas. But tonight is the preparation of the Deliverer. We're going to meet the central human character of the book of Exodus, Moses the Deliverer. Now, perhaps the most famous line in Shakespeare's play, Twelfth Night, says that some men are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. And I think we can really see all three of those in the life of Moses. We're going to see there were certainly great and and special circumstances around his birth. We're going to see him him labor and and, and be right and and great before the Lord. But obviously, when we get into the the burning bush, greatness is going to be thrust upon Moses as well. But today is is his birth and God's really uh, preparation of him. So if you look at with with me in the book of Exodus, we'll start, we won't read the whole chapter, but we'll start there in verse 1. And if you're there, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took to a wife of the daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived, and bare a son, and when she saw that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, and daubed it with slime and pitch, and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done with him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, And the maidens walked along the river's side, and when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent the maid to fetch it. When she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. She had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Skip down to verse 10. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens and he spied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out to the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together and he said to him that did wrong, wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? He said, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killed the Egyptian? Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from from the face of Pharaoh, and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Verse 21, and Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses Zipporah his daughter, and she bare him a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the historical record of Exodus. We thank you for the life of Moses, Lord, a man greatly used by you but a man with failings and stumblings that we can learn from. Please help us to see how you would apply these things to our lives. Guide me to speak only your truth in this time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Again, we meet here Moses, the Deliverer. We're going to see God ordaining him. We're going to see God preparing him for the task that's going to lie ahead, which is going to be the Deliverer, the human Deliverer of the nation of Israel. We're going to see Moses try to do things his way and the futility and and the strife that comes from that. And as a result, he's going to spend some time on the shelf, if you will. And and this is all a reminder to us that nothing in our lives is accidental. We are positioned by God. Circumstances are brought about by God. Uh, We are prepared for what he has for us. But we need to do things God's way, not our way. And we need to avoid the temptations to go off to the side and to sin or things like that and stick to the path that God has prepared. So we'll look tonight at the baby deliverer, the brash deliverer, and the banished deliverer. The baby deliverer is in the first ten verses here. And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And she conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months." As as oftentimes happens with Scripture, last chapter we were in the broad. We're looking at this whole nation of Israel that is prospering and and multiplying mightily. And now we're down to just one couple, two people. And what a reminder to us that God works through individuals. God works through normal people. And this should be an encouragement to us and a challenge to us as well. But notice these people don't even get names. And remember, who was the human author of the book of Exodus? It's Moses. 
but he wasn't led by the Holy Spirit to even name his parents at this time. But in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 20, they do get names. And Amram took him Jochebed, his father's sister, to wife, and she bare him Aaron and Moses. And the years of the life of Amram were 137 years. Amram and Jochebed. Amram means people of the highest. Jochebed means Jehovah is glorious. What great names for two people. And they're both of the tribe of Levi. And Levi we find to be an exceedingly faithful tribe. Remember Levi, he, he was in great sin. He was brash and, and a violent man. But just like Jude, I think in his personal life there was repentance and a changed heart. And that was born out in his tribe, what would become the priestly tribe. You don't have to turn, but in Exodus 32, 26, when there was strife, when there was wickedness uh, because of the, the golden calf, Moses called who is on the Lord's side, and it was the, his, his brethren, it's the tribe of Levi that answered that call and, and stood up for the Lord and slew those doing wickedness, and, and in light of that, they were called to be the priestly tribe. In, in there where I mentioned their names in Exodus 6 and verse 16, these are the names of the sons of Levi according to their generations, Gershon and Kohath and Merari. So those are the three families of the Levites. And then in verse 18, the sons of Kohath, Amram. So that would seem to indicate that Amram is a grandson to Levi. Now there's many that will say, well, they were in Egypt 400 years, so that can't be. It's, it's another Kohath. But if you would look with me at Numbers chapter 26. I think this provides some additional details there. Numbers chapter 26, verses 57 and 59. And these are they who were numbered of the Levites after their families, of Gershom, the family of the Gershonites, of Kohath, the family of the Kohathites, of Merari, the family of the Merarites. These are the families of the Levites, the family of the Libnites, the families of the Hebronites, the family of the Mahalites, the family of the Mushites, the family of the Korathites, and Korath, and Kohath, excuse me, begat Amram. So in verse 58 there, you're talking about the son of Levi, Kohath, and then the next phrase is Kohath begat Amram. I think you have to do violence to the text to say it's a different Kohath than, than the son of Levi, but what really seals it for me is the next verse, verse 59. And the name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, whom her mother bare to Levi in Egypt, and she bare unto him Amram unto Amram, Aaron and Moses, and Miriam, their sister. So I think without doing real violence to the text, we have to believe that Jochebed was the literal daughter of Levi, the, the son of Jacob, and that um, Amram was a grandson there. And, and this is important because in Genesis 15, 16, God tells Abraham he mentions four generations in the captivity and the land is not theirs. Well, we, we have that. If we have Levi, we have Kohath, we have Amram, and we have Moses. So I just I draw some attention to that because many people argue otherwise, but I, I think to be faithful to the text, we have to say that. And that's one thing that leads me to believe that, that the 400 years of, of sojourning includes the time in Canaan, and it's only 215 years in Exodus, because if it's 400 years in Egypt, rather, those generations wouldn't make sense. And I'll follow up on that in future messages, but I put that there to your thought. So Moses, a great grandson of Levi. And Moses is a type of Christ in many ways, but first we have to think back to Exodus chapter 1. What was going on there? A king was trying to destroy the male children. He called for all the male children to be killed. Do we have a parallel of that? Well, yeah, Herod's decree for, for all the male children to be killed in Bethlehem. So uh, uh, a wicked king trying to destroy the deliverer and, and killing many children in the process, and, and both would fail. This is a, a new pharaoh, remember? He, he didn't know Joseph or Joseph's God. We think this is back to native Egyptians after the Hyksos. And, and something I didn't mention last week, but he didn't remember Joseph but this Pharaoh also didn't know Joseph's God. The, the Pharaoh that Joseph knew, he knew there was something about this guy, and, and Joseph always made clear that his revelation came from God. This Pharaoh didn't know Joseph's God. In Exodus 5, 2, and Pharaoh said, he's speaking to Moses, who is the Lord, that's Jehovah, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go. I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. These Pharaohs did not know the Lord, but God was sure going to teach them. 
as he brought the plagues upon the nation of Egypt. But as we see the, the generations here, Levi and his sons, the children of Israel, they sure remembered who the Lord was, and they were faithful to him. Levi's family did, but as we go through Exodus and, and the law, we're going to find that there was much idolatry in the nation of Israel and that other families forgot the Lord their God. And it's just an important reminder for us how short memories are and how we need to make sure to share our faith with each succeeding generation. You think, oh, my kids grew up in church or, or they're... We need to make sure everybody starts in our family and, and then in our community and our nation that each new generation learns the word of God so that they might know him because the, the, the memory is just so short. But this woman, she bears a son. Gen or Exodus one twenty two. that son should have been killed, but she had the faith to follow God and to not kill him. And for that, would you look with me back in Hebrews chapter 11 in the hall of faith? And we're going to be coming back here, uh, and this is part of, of what the writer of Hebrews has to say about Moses, but really this part applies to his parents. Hebrews 11.23, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. That was an act of faith. They were risking their lives to preserve this child, but they had the trust in God and the faith to protect him. And he's described as a goodly child. The idea is he, he fulfilled all expectations. He was all as he should be. It was all she could have asked for in a son. Physically and, and as other portion of scripture reference, it just seems like there was something about him that, that they knew he, he was bound for greatness, both physically and spiritually. This word goodly, it's the same word that God used for creation when it was very good. So there's, it's all proper, he's all proper and as he should be. So this is a special child. So his mother, she kept him. She loved him. She met all the needs of this growing child, but she hid him because none could know that a Hebrew boy was born or he would be killed. And she did this three months. Verse 3, when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch, put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done with him. It's not easy to hide a baby. Moses grew, he started rooching around more, his lungs grew, he could make more noise. She realized that she couldn't hide the child. And this is an example of, of faith. People say, oh, she should have had enough faith that God would protect them. Faith, God opens doors. Faith is not just blindly saying, well, God's going to take care of the situation and not doing what we can do. So she had faith to save the child, but now she has faith to put her child in God's care in this ark on the riverbank. So the child can't be concealed. She doesn't want him to be killed, so what does she do? She makes a teva, translated, it's a chest, or it's translated here, an ark. The only other thing this is used to describe is Noah's ark. It's a different word from, say, the ark of the covenant. But what a great parallel between these two. A vessel put on water to save life. Noah's was put on the great flood waters to save all life on earth, but this little ark is on the river Nile to save one little baby. It was, had slime and pitch, that's probably tar that would have waterproofed this wicker basket and allowed it to float. And likewise in Genesis 6.14 the, the, the ark was, was slimed, it was waterproofed. Again, the, the protection of God that will keep all other things out. So she puts the child in it. Uh, it becomes clear that this is some kind of closed thing. She puts a lid on the basket, and she sets it there on the River Nile. Now, it's not floating down the river. She puts it in the, the papyrus, the reeds that's at the edge, so it would just kind of sit there. And, and then Miriam, we get her name in Exodus fifteen twenty. his older sister, she stands on the bank, she, and she's going to watch what happens. And it's not mentioned here, but Aaron was older than Moses, so Aaron's already born at this point, too. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. When she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. A little bit of time-wise here. Exodus, we can 
traced pretty closely to 1446 BC. We know Moses was 40 years old when he went to Midian, spent 40 years in Midian, so that backs us up to 1526 BC. And to the best we can recollect, Thutmose I was the reigning pharaoh. So it's one of his daughters. And we don't know for sure, but many believe that, that this daughter was Hepshetsut, who, who would be very famous in Egypt, and she would be a co-ruler, a regent, and actually a reign as a female pharaoh for a, a point on her own. But anyhow, she is bathing in the Nile. She's got her attendants there nearby, and I'm guessing... There's a lot of animals and things in the Nile, so everybody was keeping a sharp eye out when Pharaoh's daughter was there, but she's the one that notices this. It's, it's a black basket. It's a slimy, tarry basket. This is obviously man-made, and she, she's curious, and she sends one of her maids to go get it. She, she opens the lid, and she sees a baby inside. And the baby wept. It's, it's crying. And perhaps that's what drew her attention there in the first place, that this, this crying baby, it drew her to him. And I just find it a little bit interesting that Moses can cry now. He's got no problem drawing attention to himself now. A little bit later when God asks him to be a spokesperson, Moses says, well, I can't talk. And I just hope that we're never like that. That, oh, we got no problem using our voice to cry and whine and complain. But then when God asks us to say a word for him, all of a sudden we're tongue-tied and can't talk. Make sure we can use our mouth for the Lord. But Pharaoh's daughter sees him and, and perhaps... She's likewise just struck that this is a, there's something about this child. And she realizes what the great lengths the mother went to to save this child. So she had compassion on him, a, a gentle and tender concern. And literally the, the, word, the Hebrew word of compassion, it means to spare. She spared this child because she could have easily said, well, if Hebrew child, the law says you're to die. Can't do anything about it. But she spares the child. And she knew it was a Hebrew child. It would have been clear, perhaps there's a complexion difference, but the obvious thing, a baby laying there, that this baby was, would have been circumcised. So she would have immediately recognized it as a Hebrew. He was supposed to be killed, but she refused, and she considered Moses to be a gift of the river. Verse 7, Then said his sister, that's Miriam, to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. <clears throat> Miriam was here on the lookout, but I don't think she was expecting Pharaoh's daughter to be the one to come up and to grab a hold of this basket. But nevertheless, Miriam, who would have been a child at this time, she bravely, she steps up and speaks to Pharaoh's daughter. And, and, of course, she's not acting like, oh, I've been watching, waiting for this. She acts as she just happened to come. Oh, you got a baby, a little Hebrew baby there. Do you want me to go get somebody to take care of that for you? So she offers to get a Hebrew nurse. And the Hebrews, from what we've seen, they would have made good nurses. They were known for being vigorous and, and good at child rearing. So they'd make an ideal nurse. And, and this woman would physically nurse and feed this child. And we believe that his mother probably had him for about two years so Miriam, she brings the child's mother. She brings Jochebed to take care of baby Moses. Of course, Pharaoh's daughter doesn't realize this. And that's been the tale of royalty throughout history. It, it's a big deal to get an heir. You want a son, but you don't want to be bothered to take care of it, so you farm that out to, to somebody else. And that's exactly what Pharaoh's daughter does. And she says, I will give you your wages. Jochebed not only has her son saved, but now Jochebed is paid to raise her own child. Friend, hey, God, he's got a bit of a sense of humor, but God blesses faith. God, God blesses his faithful people in ways that we could not even imagine. All Jochebed wanted was her son to live, and now she gets to care for him and, and gets paid to boot. What an amazing God she served and that we serve still today. And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She called his name Moses, and she said, because I drew him out of the water. Moses' early appearance was no fluke. He, as he grew, he was, he was a strong child. He was an attractive child. He, he was smart. He was respected. So Pharaoh's daughter formally adopts this boy. She treats her like his own, and <clears throat> Moses was raised in the court the royal court 
of Egypt. Now, some claim, but I, I don't think there's any indication that, that Moses was being groomed to be Pharaoh. I don't think they would have stood for that, for a Hebrew to be the Pharaoh, but he was, he was in the upper echelons of state there. Now I'd like to turn to Acts chapter 7. This is Stephen in, before, when he's preaching to the, the Sanhedrin, and he's giving the history of Israel. He gives special attention to Moses and his life. <clears throat> Acts 7, 20 to 22. In which time Moses was born, and he was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. So there's a little detail of his upbringing that we didn't uh, get from Exodus. That Moses got the best Egyptian education possible. They were fantastic in astronomy. He got all that. He probably got warfare. He probably got diplomacy and rhetoric, and all these things that were going to prepare him to lead the nation, first to deal with Pharaoh, and then to lead the nation, he was getting at the Egyptians' expense. He, he knew, and he did much. So she names him Moses. Now Moses in the Hebrew is, is, is Moshe, and, and the Hebrew word Masha mean, means to draw out or the drawer out. So, so Moses was drawn out of the river, and so he is Moses, and also he's going to be the one to draw Israel out of Egypt. But it would be a little odd for Pharaoh's daughter to give Moses a, a Hebrew name, but it's interesting that Musa is, is Egyptian as well as Arabic for son of water, and Moses in Arabic today is Musa. So I think she, she named him to be the son of water, but it translated right into Hebrew to, to be the drawer out, and, and it worked both ways there. So that's the baby deliverer, God preserving and preparing this little baby, and this little baby is growing. Secondly, this evening, we get the brash deliverer, <clears throat> verses 11 through 15. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens and he espied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Again, we're not told here, but elsewhere in scripture it reveals that Moses was about 40 years old at this point. So this is no young teenage upstart. He, he's a mature, educated man. And I don't know if it was through Pharaoh's daughter, but somehow he knew his Hebrew heritage. He, he knew that although he had all the trappings, as we're going to see in the third point, he looked every whit the Egyptian. He was a, a Hebrew at heart. And he knew that those people who were slaves in Egypt were his brethren. And up to this point, it seems he academically knew about the, the, the slavery of his people, but now he's going to go see for himself. And he decides, I'm going to go out and examine this thing firsthand. He's going to look on his brother, and he's identifying with them. And he saw an Egyptian overseer beating a Hebrew slave. And Moses has compassion. He identifies with this man. He recognizes this man as his brethren. And he's going to act on this overseer. But notice, Moses, this isn't a heat of passion kind of thing that he just gets all stirred up and, and strikes the man down. Moses looks this way, he looks that way, there's no one around, and then he kills the man. Moses knew exactly what he was doing. And Egyptian law is very much like Hebrew law, that murder was wrong on all accounts. He knew what he was doing, but that's how he chose to intervene on this situation. He deliberately killed the Egyptian, and he hid his body. And, and he thought, okay, this is my first step. I, I've helped one of my brother. He thought this was his first act towards delivering his people. Because although we don't see it here, look back with me at Acts chapter 7. We see that Moses knew he was going to be the deliverer. I don't know how, but Moses knew it. Acts chapter 7. Verse 23, and when he was full 40 years old, so we get that, it came to his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. 
Notice verse 25 there. He thought the the Israelites would understand that Moses was going to be God's deliverer for them. So that means Moses, I don't know, God gave him a dream or something, but he knew that he was going to deliver the nation of Israel from Egypt. And he thought, okay, this is how I'm going to go about it. Vigilante, one-man wrecking crew, protecting the Hebrew people. But A, it wasn't God's timing, B, it wasn't God's way, and therefore the Hebrews did not recognize him as their deliverer at this point. So we move on to verse 13. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together, and he said unto the one that did wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? He said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killed the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely the thing is known. Moses was very pleased with himself after the first day. He, he delivered that Hebrew man, so now he goes on another do-good tour, and he sees a similar situation, one man beating another, threatening to kill him, but this time it's two Hebrews. So he confronts the one doing the wrong. Why why would you do this? Uh, Especially, why would you wrong your fellow? You're, you're, You're both under bondage. Why are you wronging another Hebrew? And this man rejects Moses' authority. He says, who made you a a, a judge or an official to decide over us? Now, by Egyptian law, Moses was a man of some authority, and he he could have uh, had that. But these Hebrews, they don't recognize any authority. They're not ready to accept him as a leader and a deliverer. And I think that weighed on Moses' mind as he stood at the burning bush, and, and he keeps kind of talking back to God, well, well how, how are they going to know that you sent me? Why are, are the people really going to follow me? Because he had been rejected by his people a, as a judge and a leader and a deliverer once before. But the man asked, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? This man knew about the incident the day before and apparently wasn't the only one. Moses looked and he thought nobody else knew, but somebody knew and that means soon a lot of people knew. And now Moses fears punishment. Numbers 32, 23 reminds us, be sure your sin will find you out. What was true for Moses is true for us today. How often do we figuratively, we look both ways, we don't think anybody's watching, we don't think it's a big deal, but when we sin, if nobody else knows, the Lord knows, and we will be held to account for that. Moses thought he was doing the Lord's will, but he certainly wasn't doing it the Lord's way. God is never going to call on us to fulfill his will through sin. And therefore, if that seems like the path, oh, I need to sin to do this, that is not the way God is leading. But Moses was brash, he was presumptuous, and he ran ahead of the will of God, and it's going to cause problems for him. Verse 15, now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. This word even soon gets to Pharaoh. Bad news and rumors travel very, very fast. So so Pharaoh knows about this. And yes, this this is murder on the part of Moses. But it's worse than that because it's an act of rebellion. At this point, it seems likely that Moses' adopted mother has died. And especially if, if the daughter of Pharaoh was Hepshepsut, it's, it's her nephew slash stepson, there's some weird stuff with the Egyptians, that, that's on the throne now, and she had kind of tried to do influence, influence over him early in his reign, so he hated her and tried to erase all memory of her. So there would have been tension already between Pharaoh and Moses, his protector in the court was gone, and now this Hebrew boy has sided with the Hebrews over the Egyptians. So this was an act of rebellion by Moses, so Pharaoh wants to slay him right out. He sees Moses as a a leader of revolt against him. So he gets ready to kill him. So Moses flees out of Egypt. And he goes to Midian. Now now Midian is, it's the the northwestern corner of the, if you think of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, it's the northwestern corner there uh, just across the sea of, uh, the the branch of the Red Sea that's the the Gulf of Aqaba, um, right across from that from the Suez Peninsula, or Sinai Peninsula rather. So he goes to Midian. This would have been about 220 mile journey, but he goes quickly. And we see he, he dwelt in the land of Midian, that that was his plan. This isn't a temporary hideout. Moses, he doesn't expect to go back to Egypt. He's out of there and he says, I'm going to go live in Midian. 
And after a long journey, he sits down by a well along the roadside. And what we see in this is that when we do wrong or we try to do God's will our way, there's going to be a price. Moses had punishment of being banished from his homeland. He had wealth and and prosperity, and he loses it all. He gets sent to be, as he's going to describe himself, a stranger in a strange land. And he's going to be put on the shelf, essentially, and have to wait 40 years to be the deliverer that God had him to be. And it's the same with us. When we feel God's directing, but we decide to plow ahead and do it our way, we're going to make a mess of things. And, and God might have to put us on time out a little bit like he's doing here with Moses uh, until we're ready to listen and to heed what he wants. Moses had the best human education available, but he was lacking in the, the knowledge of the ways of the one true God and to follow God's will. And that's what these next 40 years and, and the burning bush experience are going to have to teach him. Third, this evening in verses 16 to 25, we have the banished deliverer. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. So we're in the land of Midian. Now remember Genesis 25, 1 and 2 teaches us that Midian and his offspring, the Midianites, these are offspring of Abraham and Korah. So, or a Keturah, Abraham and Keturah. So these are blood relatives to the Hebrews. Uh, They were the group that that the brothers sold Joseph into slavery with. And at that point, they were associated with the Ishmaelites. So that's how I think that we have the priest of Midian and all things indicate that he was a priest of the one true God. That that the Midianites had retained knowledge from their father Abraham, at least some of them had, of of worship of the one true God, Jehovah. And this man was their priest to that effect. He's called Ruel here, and and we'll have a couple different names for him. And that means friend of God. Again, that that L, it would seem to be awfully odd for for a a pagan priest to have a name referencing the one true God. But he's got seven daughters. It it will mention he, he at least has one son later, but much like in the case of Rebecca, the daughters are the oldest, so they're the ones that are put in charge of the flock. They're the responsible parties to take care of their father's sheep and goats. And that's hard work. They go to the well, draw the water up out, fill their troughs. Again, that's, that's what extolled Rebecca to the, the servant, that she would do all this hard work so faithfully. Well, that's where they go to do, but many shepherds shared the same well, and, and the, the male shepherds of the area were not very chivalrous. And they try to chase away these women so they can get their flocks watered first and they can get their day done a little bit quicker. Verse 17, and the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up. Moses rose and defended them and helped them water their flock. He he took the first step. and I love that. Moses stood up. How often is there wrong or how often there's something that needs to be done and we're sitting there and we just don't move a finger? Sometimes things happen and we've just got to stand up. We've got to stand upon the Lord's side. We can't stay on the sidelines. We need to talk, take an opportunity to do good and to serve God. James tells us that to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. So like Moses, we need to stand up and help them. And so Moses, he didn't just chase the other shepherds away. He watered their flock for them. Verse 18, and when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, how is it that ye are come so soon today? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, and where is he? Why is it that ye have left this man? Call him that he may eat bread. They returned to their father, Ruel. He's called Raguel in, in Numbers 10, 29, but we mostly know him from the name he's going to have in, in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1, and that's Jethro. There's some that kind of do some contortionist acts with some linguists and say that maybe uh, Jethro was the son of Ruel, but we got a lot of people in the Bible with multiple names. One might have been his kind of personal name and one his either position name or, or tribal name. It, it's all the same man who's eventually going to become Moses' father-in-law. So they go to Ruel, and I guess this was nothing new. These daughters usually ended up getting pushed to last in line, and they'd home late. And so he says, what are you doing home 
so early? They said an Egyptian. They don't know any different. Remember, Moses was by appearance, probably by speech, every wit the Egyptian. So he said an Egyptian man, he came and he helped them, he enabled them to water early, and, and so that's why they're home. An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds. This is Moses' first deliverance. It's a small one. He helped some girls water some sheep. But this time he was working with the right motives, and he was doing things God's way, and he has his first small deliverance. And that's going to help bring him into the graces of this family and help prepare him. Friend, great things can have very, very small beginnings. On, on that little task, taking up that teaching post, being willing to do that devotional, uh, just saying yes to helping that person or doing this job in the church, you never know how the Lord might use that and what that might lead to. But we just need to get in the habit of, of standing up and saying yes. But Jethro, he was a man of Arab hospitality. If anybody comes through, you're supposed to invite them in, but this man helped his daughters get their job done. And he's like, why in the world did you let this man be? Why didn't you bring him home? Why didn't you invite him to stay with us? So they run and get him. And, and they're going to feed him and care for him. Verse 21, and Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses Zipporah his daughter, and she bare him a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. Jethro's offering hospitality here, but also for a man with seven daughters. It's not bad to have a, an upstanding, strong man around here in the house. He offers for Moses to stay and work there, and it says Moses was content to dwell there. And Egypt was behind him. The, the Hebrews, they were behind him. He thought, okay, this is going to be my life. So he stays there with Jethro and with his family. Let's look at how Hebrews chapter 11 puts this. Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect on the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses was content that he wasn't going to go back and ever try to stake his claim at, at his estate in Egypt. He wasn't going to try to claim, reclaim the riches, the power, the authority. He had the faith to say, I don't need any of that. I can leave that all behind and God is going to take care of me from here on. So he's going to stay here with these people, these God worshipers, these people who worship the Lord. And Moses says he is content, but I'm, I'm afraid at this point Moses probably figured he was a failure. That he was to be the deliverer, and he blew it. And so, okay, I'll just live out my life here in anonymity. I won't be in a position of power. I won't be in a position to hurt anybody anymore. I'll just do my thing over here in Midian and live out my life days. We know that God had other plans for him. But to, to keep and reward Moses, Jethro offers Moses his daughter, and, and Moses marries Zipporah, which means sparrow. And again, this, we, we see that Moses is, is being a type of Christ here, and in this he really mirrors Joseph, that he is, first, he's rejected, rejected by the, the nation of Israel. They reject him as their deliverer. So he goes and gets a Gentile bride, a Midianite bride. But Zipporah again worships the Lord, and like Christ, Moses is going to come back. And when he does, Israel is then going to accept him as their deliverer, just when Christ returns to the nation of Israel. But Zipporah bears Moses a son, and he calls the son Gershom, which means sojourner. Moses says, I am a stranger in a strange land. And in saying this and doing this, he, he's reflecting on his exile and, and he's really identifying himself with the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They didn't own the land they lived on. They were strangers in a strange land. Like them, Moses' focus, as, as Hebrews described it there, he, he looked past the earthly riches and reward. He had respect to the reward that God was going to give. His citizenship was in heaven. 
So even though he had no expectation how God was going to use him later, no expectation of the reward God was going to give him, he was content to be a sojourner for the Lord in this strange land. So he names his son Gershom. And it's not mentioned here, but he would later have another son, Eliezer, which means God is my help. And that shows that he's not bitter about this. He's just resigned to that fact, but he trusts the Lord anyway. And then we kind of have a, an aside or an epilogue here, verses 23 to 25. And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried, and their cry came unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. In the process of time, the king of Egypt died Again, some 40 years have passed with Moses in Midian just being a humble shepherd, a husband, and a father. And all this was perfect to fulfill God's timing of their oppression. So the king died. And the fact that we've got a 40-year time period here, it seems that this would have been a king with a long reign. So this would match with Thutmose III, who reigned 54 years and would fit roughly right time-wise. And he had a successful reign. Thutmose III was a great builder. But this was done on the backs of his Hebrew slaves. So the king dies, and, and, and I think the Hebrews kind of rose, and they, they had hope of a change. A new leadership will bring some change. And then his, his son, Amenhotep II, comes and, and continues their bondage. And Amenhotep II was known for his cruelty, and he increased the burden of the Hebrews. And, and they groaned under their labor and their bondage. And they cried to the Lord in prayer. And God heard their prayers. Praise the Lord that we worship a God who hears prayers. The groanings of our heart come before him and he hears. And he, it's described as he remembered. And this doesn't mean that God had forgotten. It's like, oh, that's right, I left those people there in Egypt. The idea of remember, it's used in the context of acknowledging a covenantal obligation. God, said, God is basically responding to them, I have not forgotten the Abrahamic covenant, and I am going to fulfill each and every part of that. God observed Israel with an eye towards helping them. He, he knew them. That means he acknowledged them and their relationship with him, and he is going to act on their behalf. Notice in here, it, it's all about God's actions and his covenant. It's not that the nation of Israel were, were so worthy. We're, we're going to see when they're in, in the wilderness that they had picked up idolatrous practices, some of them in the land of Egypt. It wasn't that they were just bearing up with such a good face that God respected them. There was nothing in Israel that commended them to God, but yet God saved them by His grace based on the covenant. And that's the same with us. There's nothing that commends us before the Lord, but God had made the new covenant. The covenant that He would send, and it's in the Abrahamic covenant to bless all nations through Abraham's seed, that's through Christ. And God has made the covenant with each who would put faith in Christ that he would save them. He's going to save Israel just as he promises to save us. We've seen the baby deliverer. Moses was protected and preserved. This, this deliverer brought into the world. The brash deliverer, he thought he could do things his own way. He had all the wealth, the power, the education. But when he went his own way, things fell apart. So we see the banished deliverer. He's going to spend 40 years as a shepherd in Midian until God's going to call him. Friend, God works mightily through people. God works mightily through ordinary people. You don't have to be the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. God can work through you, but often before God works through people, God's got to work on people. God's got to, to shape us, to mold us, to get his ready. God providentially places and protects us for his work. But there's going to be temptations to, I see what he's doing here. I'm going to go ahead and take care of this. I'm going to do things my way. We've just got to be patient for the Lord's timing. Don't plow ahead. We need to listen and do things his way. Choose him first. Don't run ahead of the Lord. Friend, don't think you can get away with sin, that it won't find you out. It certainly will. But remember, even when you feel a, the, the yoke and burden are heavy upon you, God never forgets you. You can cry to him and he will hear you. Friend, if you know Christ as your savior, I know that God has a plan and purpose for you. But as you look at your life, if you're honest, 
does God need to do some work on you before he can work through you? Will you let him do it? There's going to be some, some rubbing, some sanding, but will you let the Lord do what he needs to do? Are you a follower of the power and wealth of this world, the position that, that Egypt, if you will, offers? Are you a follower of your own will, or do you wait, choose to wait on God's timing and direction? Maybe the Lord has on your heart, there's a sin you're hiding that you need to deal with that you think nobody knows about, but God does. Whatever it is, whether it's leading, whether it's sin, whether it's a matter of, of just oppression you feel upon yourself, cry out to God, He will hear you, and He will answer you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the example of Moses. We thank you that, that you hear us, Lord, that you are not deaf to our needs, to our prayers. We thank you that you love us. Lord, we thank you that you use and work through us. Please help us to see what work you have to do on us, that we would let you do that. Please help us to be patient and wait for your timing. And please help us to just obey whatever you would lead us to. We love you, Lord, and we ask these favors in Jesus' name. This time I'm going to come down front, and if you did not observe the Lord's Supper with us this morning and you'd like to, I invite you to come up.